for those of you who don't know myself, my name is Alistair O'Neill, or Al for short, whatever works, we are fine. Uh, I'm the technical product owner of GovCMS. I've been with the program for two and a half years, give or take, at this sort of point in time. Uh, I've previously been a customer, so I've actually sat on that other side, the teams at Australia and Finance, and then joined, as you do in the pandemic, uh, a new project that did different things in this sort of space. So that's a bit of a moment back there. there. Vaughn, I think you've also come from the customer side too, different journey, but... I'll try and yell first. Um, so my name's Yvonne, I've been in and around GovCMS for about five years, starting as on, like, on the customer side and then getting the opportunity to see how all the cogs turn behind the work behind the scenes uh, at GovCMS, so it's actually quite exciting. I started in the onboarding side, so actually from the onboarding and to the project management side. Great. Um, one thing you did mention Yvonne is you've been the project manager previously for our 8 to 9 migration. And guess who's holding the keys again for 9 to 10? This one right here. Brilliant. So, I you know there's a lot of people here who are familiar with Cup CMS, but we always like to do the spiel anyway. So, if you're not familiar with Cup CMS, I'm sure there's at least two people in the room who probably aren't. Either that or I'm a broken record. Uh, about us, so as Cup CMS is a program, um, it's a by government, for government hosting solution. So, when we think about people who are actually sitting on our, on our platform, using our product, they sit in that government space. So most of our customers sit at that federal level. We've got a few state ones, we've got a couple of local ones as well. Um, or we've got entities that sit in that space that are otherwise government ones. So ones that feel like they're a private entity but probably won't actually aren't. Uh, and so of course we've got coverage across all of those three, but I'd say probably our big, big sort of fish are federal. Um, we turned seven this year, so been around for a while. Um, like to think we're doing a good thing. Tell me otherwise. Um, maybe not now, maybe later. Um, <laughs> maybe your questions. Um, so in that sort of space, it feels like we've been able to build from there, go from strength to strength. Um, going back to when I mentioned when I was a customer, we were very early on when I was at IP Australia, and we're now to our next slide. Um, number one, um, we're just about to hit 350 live websites. So tells me we've got growth. We've always got quite a few in the pipeline. That number's always somewhere around 40 to 50. That could be upgrades, that could be transitions to new things. Something's always happening. It never stops, good or bad. Um, and of course, we've got 105 organizations signed up with us. Some of those will have a lot of projects. One of them, some of them might only have one. Uh, and of course, that's normally circles. Apologies for the branding today. Um, moving from Windows 10 PowerPoint to LibreOffice on the Mac, um, turn those circles to squares. Good to see we no longer have any of these technological challenges as we switch between platforms. But always do it the night before too, so that's how it works out really well. So, when we think about our offerings at GovCMS, um, when we talk to customers and when they come to the front door and knock, I usually ask myself, um, we've got two hosting solutions. I only think I should missed something. So we actually work with Salsa Digital and Amazing, who are both here, both sponsoring, in our actual hosting solution. So we do a lot of work with the teams that are here today and some of the people who couldn't make it. So chat to them. If you don't know them, go and have a chat to them. It's some smart people that we work with. Uh, anywho, back to our hosting options. So when we think about our two offerings, we land in a space of well, software as a service and a platform as a service. Now when we're talking about a managed service, we are very much going to land on our SaaS space here. We do have a slide at the end for PaaS. Um, but if a bit of a breakdown there, 75% of those sites that we've got, going back to those numbers, land in that SaaS space. 25% sit on that other PaaS site. Um, when we think about SaaS, we're looking at infrastructure. We're looking at the distribution. We're doing things around security. We drive updates to that distribution. We drive updates to our infrastructure. All of those things. It's all very much encompassed in that service, as is the intent. From a PaaS side, we do still do that infrastructure. However, that's where things start to change. We talk to our site owners. And they're the ones managing their distribution. They might be using ours as a starting point. They might be extending on top of it. They might be rolling their own. As long as it's Drupal and they're doing it safely, fingers crossed, 
<laughs> it's a good thing. Um, for them as well, there's also that security layer. So for them, it's, the onus is on them to maintain and manage those things. Um, and when we think about those updates, well, it's on them again to drive those through, time them out as it works with them as a product and as a solution. Um, SAS is the main focus of this one, and we will have that touch point at the end for PaaS. Great. So, digging into SAS a bit more. Ah, oh, there's another little font trick um, between the devices. Lovely. Um, so, we have fixed distribution for SAS. So, it's a good thing, it's a bad thing. Um, but it's designed to be out of the box. So, for a lot of the informational websites that we host, apologies for the feedback, um, it should meet a lot of needs. And if we reflect back to that number of 75%, it sounds like it does. There's always room for improvement. Now, what we obviously aim to do with an open source product is we want to give that back to the community, we want people to be able to download, use it extended as they see fit, or leverage what we've got, figure out whether or not we're the right fit for them. Um, and of course, we put that out on GitHub, along with some of our other products. And of course, we want suggestions, we want people to review those things, and we want feedback from our community or just more and broader general people who are interested in these sorts of things. Hello, the room. Mm -hmm. um, and again, coming back, that vast majority of cases, when we think about from a business perspective and customers who are looking to come to us, a lot of them are looking for stability, surety, security, and things that are otherwise managed for them. Um, I'm not sure everyone's background in the room, but what we find is some teams aren't well funded. They don't have the capacity to do a lot of these things. A lot of teams are otherwise communication teams. So they've got a great focus for the material that they're good at, what they need to get out to the public, but maybe there's a few other gaps in some of these other spots, such as security or keeping things up to date. So that's where a lot of that benefit ends up being realised for our customers. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Within that space, our sign owners, thinking back to those communication roles, they sit in a space where they can maintain their content, do whatever they need there, they can roll whatever governance process they need around publishing, they can do their information architecture. For any of us who are around Drupal long enough, they're all very simple things to do, but it's something that's back on that customer side. And of course, the question that usually comes up again as well from an engagement side, customers do ask about where those some sort of limitations are between SaaS and us. Within SaaS, the big one for most of them is, can we theme it, can we make it look like how we want to? And that is an option. Um, maybe that's not clear in how we're putting that material out, so possibly a bit of work for us to do there. But they can obviously control what that looks like in the branding experience, in their strategies, and of course, the higher ups making sure that they get what they want within a reason. I hope. Right. So, with a few of those things, there's obviously quite a few positives in that space. So, again, security patching and the currency of the product, that's on us. That's us, that's us, us as GovCMS. That's not necessarily the two of us here, but a couple of them are other robot. He, he was here from GovCMS. He's part of their job. There's also a few more talks on that's the sales part. Check the calendar. Um, and of course, when we think SaaS, that's the price that we advertise on the site. The number that we have listed there is the number you pay to do those things in SaaS. So it's not a secret, it's not a surprise. Hopefully a good thing, especially for those working with financials and the budgets. Um, again, infrastructure and application layers are covered. One less thing to worry about. It's all once again part of that price, it's part of our offering, we just do it. Um, and of course, we've got some alignment there because of course as a government agency, we're trying to fit government needs. So of course we have an IRA accreditation, and of course, a big one as well for information on public sites or partly closed sites, classification level. And for those who are really excited, that's up to official sensitive. It means we can grab a fair bit of information. Not a lot of those secret things. Probably a good thing too for public facing sites. Um, and of course, that other sort of level there as well, the trust and reliance in your product. So we have uptime, we have availability. We're the ones solving those problems. Now, Hopefully a good thing. Now, 
Of course, the offset of that is they're all great things for customers, hooray. That does make a lot of work for us though. So that's the offset, but that's what we're being paid for. Um, so of course, when we think about at least some of the things that we're doing, um, we're of course monitoring for things like security advisories. Obviously, a lot of that's coming downstream from Drupal, but we also have a security team who's looking at not only just the Drupal layer, but also those other aspects our infrastructure and other supporting tools that we have in space. So we're the ones that are reviewing our stack, we're the ones that are identifying what those problems are, risk assessing them, and then of course if there's an action one, getting to the point of actually resolving those things. Um, of course, regular patching, all the time. We're doing those updates, we're looking at those module updates, we're looking at patches that obviously fix outstanding problems or cause issues at the application layer, we're doing those core coverages, we're doing those security advisories we <coughs> mentioned. And of course, we've got a pretty frequent release schedule. Um, for those of you tracking along from our status page, we've actually started doing the deployment this morning as of 5 a.m. So that's rolling through our platform as we speak. Um, fingers crossed that'll be done at least for our live sites um, sometime this afternoon, if not tomorrow morning. Um, of course, a big one as well is living up to our ethos. So, of course, if we're going to say we're open source and doing things like that, we obviously want to give back, not only in the things that we're making, but obviously we want to help the community as well. And of course, we have to be on top and in front of a lot of these things. It means a lot of work, it means a lot of chasing, but again, tying back to that security and surety for our customers, that's part of the gig, whether <laughs> we like it or not. That's what we sign ourselves up for, and that's how we sell ourselves. And that's a really important thing. Now, yeah, into a form. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, I just wasn't sure. Thanks. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, so the eight to nine, that that was when. Let's do the next one. So the overall project from automating, automating. The eight to nines upgrades for over 170 websites consisted of two very large streams of work. Uh, there was the entire technical aspect um, of creating the distribution and what and how the automations were. Uh, um, and overall, our approach of automating the SaaS websites uh, was broken down into a nice three easy step process. We build the foundations, do the security assessment, uh, and then we launch the websites. But equally as massive was the stakeholder engagement of the entire change man management process over the two to three year program period. Um, I officially joined the D9 project in September 20, um, but the initial planning and implementation of the project started at least 18 months, two years prior, with Nathan and team um, socializing with customers uh, the idea that Drupal 9 is coming and get ready. Uh, so in some respects, there was a lot of lead time, and uh, in others, it didn't feel that way. Uh, but the meaty fun stuff didn't start until uh, it ramped up around June, July uh, 2020, once D9 was released. Um, and when I came on board, the Gov CMS service ops and DevOps teams uh, were well underway starting the D9 foundations. Um, towards the end of 2020, we had our first D9 candidate release um, and the final refinements and pen testing to do other security and other security assessments took place in February to April. We planned to launch the distro at the end of April. We had a bit of a false start and we launched two weeks later on the 11th of May. Um, we worked We wrote too many notes. We did. So, we did. Sorry. And <laughs> as I'm, we scan through the items, I'm Mac impaired. So uh, bear with. Me. Yeah. So we launched the distribution on the 11th of May. We worked through the automation process with agencies over a four-month period, um, and we aimed a target date of 30 August to have all our D D8 sites in D9 giving ourselves a nice two month buffer, which we ended up using to get some of those stragglers across the line. Uh, and then we retired the DA distro in November. Um, throughout the whole project, the team needed to maintain 
uh, as Al said, the distro. So there's a lot of BAU, core, and critical updates going on at the same time for such a small team. Uh, okay. uh, the first priority for the upgrade was to denitify our DA distro. Um, this was done in such a way, well, the purposefully done, in, uh, so that once we made that final leap in the automations, there was such a minimal gap that there was less room for things to break. Um, it also meant on average that at that point, um, we were updating the district fortnightly, which was a lot, uh, quite intense time. Um, so again, including the security patches and all the upgrades. Part of D9 applying uh, and was reviewing the D8 module usage, analyzing where they still needed and what were we going to do if there wasn't a D9 part. Um, what were some of the changes that we made? Uh, well, we deliberately made D9 as vanilla as possible. Only security and oh my gosh, this is not going well. Um, press this button. Uh, where am I to? Changes, minimums, out of the box. We made D9 as vanilla as possible. Possible. This was to help our reporting so that. Uh, we could actually get a good um, good view and landscape of what modules were being used on the platform. We made TFA mandatory um, in line with the Essential 8 advice, Security um, Essential 8. Uh, we deliberately made configuration management out of the box disabled. So remembering that most of our sites were set and forget um, and we only advised that this was enabled during active development. Um, suits the large majority of our client. Um, and then uh, on the technical hands standpoint, we consolidated the distribution, the distribution, scaffold, and the boon repositories in GitHub so it was nice and easy to find. So a little bit about the automation process um, and that was applied when we denitified the idea of our DA website. The CR pipelines were used to emulate the upgrade process. Tests were run, rerun, and rerun again until all known gardens were green. So using uh, the iterative automated resolutions approach that DevOps did, um, they started with the more easy solutions and progressively worked up to the more for example, some of those issues range from simple method name changes through to changing tweak contained in new configuration. It's a bit too technical, but that's what I've told were the examples for me. Um, what was that? Uh, but still at the end of it, we've needed some custom resolutions for a few edge cases. So what did the on-platform implementation look like for customers? Uh, with the great foundational work that the service ops and DevOps team had done, by the time we got to the finish line to complete that final upgrade, we had denitified 90% of the website. Um, processing uh, for agencies was all done using a feature branch from within their project. Um, and this helped the customer's focus, um, but it also helped uh, us. So because, uh, sorry, I'll take that back. Uh, because of the technical stuff that DevOps needed to do, how we created that branch for customers. Um, the agencies were given the opportunity to uh, identify and fix any issues from within that branch. Um, we provided a simple checklist for uh, business owners, remembering that most websites were set up yet. Uh, they didn't have um, developers. Um, we knew that you know the agencies themselves would be the best place to spot the things that were wrong with their websites. Uh, and then once a customer or an agency had confirmed that they were, they were all finished and they put their content freeze in place, uh, they handed the keys back to us because of some more technical things that DevOps needed to do. We switched their site live. Um, all up, uh, it was actually a very nice minimal impact to the customer on that end. With up to a one day content freeze and it was done. Um, 
Uh, so visually, uh, this is how my time frame, frame looked. Um, our full start of our launch meant that we sort of cut out group one and smooshed them into group two. Um, but all nice, it was nice little waterfall and an agile bridge. Um, we even got a little break in between June and July. Um, which was nuts. Uh, but uh, with groups one and two, not surprisingly, it didn't actually have any impact because we had not too many people volunteer. But one of them was in the room for group one. <laughs> and us. Thank um, you. Yep. <laughs> but other than that, the rest of our uh, hundred odd agencies, it, it didn't impact anyone. Um, as I mentioned before, we scheduled over a four month period. Uh, each agency was given two months, uh, two months, ooh, two weeks to do their UAT and I'd kick it off in a round robin as we went through the whole process. Um, for the most part, agencies stuck to their two weeks. Some slipped and some were early at all, even out. Um, on average, it was, um, I, I planned 170 groups, 170 projects in eight groups, which is about 20 per, pro, um, per group, 20 projects. Uh, when we switched it down to seven, it's about 25 in a group. And agencies nicely even themselves. Um, they picked which group they went into, so that meant that uh, they picked the time frame that has suited them around their other BAU priorities. Um, <clears throat> uh, as I mentioned earlier, the project was two massive streams of work. Uh, we had a lot of, um, uh, oh, sorry, we had every two months information and QA sessions. Uh, as anyone knows, working with large volumes of customers, validating contacts, the changing faces, it, uh, it's a constant, uh, I will say that myself. Um, we had to work with their competing priorities and timeframes. Um, a lot of what I had to do was aligning their, our, our priorities, our customers' priorities with their, uh, with their customer windows. And what was that capacity for the customers to do this? What was their technical ability to do this if most of them didn't have developers? Um, it was a challenge, it was a great challenge, and I'm excited to do it again. Um, there were many more challenges throughout the project. Um, so once I just said the capacity and availability to, uh, of the agencies to deliver, um, the customer knowledge and capabilities, um, and this ranges from the very, very less technical where their websites are five minutes a day you know, for a whole month, that's all they spend, to the very technical there are you know, teams standing on board. Um, the timeframes themselves were at the time, didn't feel too pressured. Uh, there were definitely some squish, you know, some, some squish points. Squish um, one of the biggest challenges we found, and we'll find again, is what actually do the customers build? Uh, how are we going to automate it, um, and what can we do? Uh, so, nicely, <coughs> here's my nice proposed approach: develop the distribution. Uh, we invited the, you know, the developers to test the D9 distribution, we iterated the distribution, we invited the D7 owners to move to D8 to join our process to you know, get them across the line. We did a security assessment and we were going to launch the D9 district. And that was a very nice plan that I had at the beginning. Uh, but this is how it felt. <laughs> there were some ups, there were some downs, there were some squiggles, there were some backwards and forwards. But, uh, that is the most accurate reflection of 2021. <laughs> so as an end result, what happened? We had some very big wins. Um, all of our D8 sites became D9 um, before end of July. Um, we had very limited issues on very limited sites, so most of the automations took care of the vast majority of it, um, and even those limited issues on limited sites, we had denied by 90% of their sites. So they only had a tiny little bit to get it across the line. Um, we managed the process within the existing projects, which meant not increasing projects, not dual publication, not large content freezes. Um, we just denied their website in the background. Um, 
At the end of it, you'll see there's got down to two distributions to maintain seven and nine, so we reduced our technical debt there. Um, more opportunities for targeted branches and preview environments. So through using this, uh, based on this D9 to D8, D8 to D9 process, uh, we implemented our preview environments um, so that we could give agencies the opportunity to test their, their PHP upgrades, which we did 7.4 to 8.1, and then a month or two later, we did the preview branches when we moved 9.3 to 9.4. Uh, and customer developers were more involved throughout that process. So there were so many things to celebrate. So, there's some really good positives out of that. Um, it gets me a bit excited. Um, time frames, I think we're both still a bit worried about, but we've done it before, we can do it again. So, what do you think about some of those lessons to learn? Um, on our left here, we've got our wood lessons. We built it on the platform. We're already working there, let's keep working there. Let's not have to shift it at some point later on. Yes, would recommend. Um, we're working in the same existing projects as the one just touched on. Top of obviously, we don't have to do a publish, we don't have to worry about things like access again. It's all there ready to go. The customer, if they're familiar, um, can already jump to it very quickly. Thankfully, when we're then expanding to those who maybe weren't so technical or maybe needed to get a sort of leg up, it wasn't too hard to then educate them. Most of them had the access. They just didn't jump into those little spaces more than we would have liked. So again, one less hurdle in the way. Um, automation where possible. Uh, run, run, run again. Oh, we could have run forever. Um, and we probably should. Um, those, those small little things that we had left over, in the scheme of things, it's great to be able to throw some resources at that. Shout out Python work, among others. Um, and of course, the big one, communication. And that ties back to a couple of points that we've had. When I think about improvements against these good things, build earlier, build often. One of the challenges we've obviously got with things upstream and downstream, but we should at least be starting. We should be trying if we can overcome hurdles now, but they're not things we have to worry about later. Very important in my mind. Um, automate more. Um, I felt like we had a really good run. Um, I think it worked quite well. I think we could have gone a couple of extra steps in those sort of spaces. Again, when we talk about capacity of our, even our own resources, let alone our customers, if it's anything from deploying those branches at a certain date and having them available to, hey, let's make sure it's in our, let's make sure it's in our mail service so we can then just hit a button and not have to surface up an email list. All of those different fronts of the process. Um, clarifying the scope, this one was when we talk about, again, a managed service, we're almost talking about everything. Everything is a lot. So for some of those things, it didn't necessarily become apparent until we got later in the piece or when a customer, the question came from a customer. Again, having clearer pegs in the ground, lining these things out. Um, targeted communication, um, as, as we've already touched on already, there's some killers here. We have a mix of audience. We've got people who are full-time developers that read and code and you know, everything around them is like the matrix. We've got other people, like Bon said, who might go in there and you know, publish a news item, but they're the web manager. So again, people's experiences, people's background, all of those sorts of things mean we need to have a better idea of who we're working with, how they need to be communicated to, what they need from us. So again, it's always going to be a challenge. Those changing faces, timeframes, don't help. But we need to be more cognizant of that. Not so good or bad. Um, timing. Timing is never great. <laughs> We're dependent on others. Others are dependent on us. We have other work going on. Uh, never. There's never a perfect time for it. You have to start. You have to accept that you have to start. Contingencies, uh, as, as we saw the journey, as we went squiggly, uh, we didn't necessarily have some of those contingencies in place to counteract those or consider. Uh, again, we have a lot of smart people who work on our platform and on our product, um, but 
the reality of some of these things is we didn't see that as something that's coming. We didn't have a resource to potentially help us in those spaces. We need to be able to consider those things and be hopefully be in front of them. Capacity, tying a bit to that as well. Do we have enough people to do these things? Do we have the right skill sets ourselves? Ignoring our customers, we've got that same thing internally. Again, we have some great partners. Who does what? Where is the line? Um, can we throw another body out of the throughputs? Do we need to upskill? What is it? Lots of questions around those sorts of things. And a big one there as well is, do we have to drop other work? And I know people don't like that, and I know our customers have expectations from us for other things as well. Some of these things we're just going to have to drop. If it is not critical, or doesn't align to our sort of end of life, or becomes a security problem, we're very good on our security ones, they go to the top of the list. Some of these other things we probably need to put a hold on. Education, again, going back to that customer point. There's a need for improvement there. How can they work through these things? What is their expectation? Um, you know, how can they feel more comfortable that their site isn't going to break? How can we make them feel more comfortable that their site isn't going to break? So when we think about improvements against those things, plan, plan, plan some more. Uh, engage more both up and downstream. So when we think downstream from us, we're talking our customers, we're talking their stakeholders. They have they want to make sure that their things aren't falling over and working, or they can release their corporate strategy, or whatever it happens to be. They still have their work going on regardless of what we're doing. When we think upstream, we use an open source product. We have a strong community in Drupal, we have passionate people that are here in this room, in this building, and around the world. We need to be better with them, spend time with them and see if we can do any support in that sort of way and give back ourselves. Those are very important things, because that then can help against our timing or our contingencies or even our capacity. Plan for the worst, aim for the best. Always a good one regardless of what sort of project you're doing. And helping customers help themselves. I think I've already touched on that, but again, giving them some confidence, making them feel comfortable about what we're doing. We're not obviously going to run a boot camp on how to do tweak templating or anything like that, but of course we need to sort of send them in the right direction, make them feel comfortable about what they need to go and do. Other considerations, oh good. Uh, <laughs> upstream changes with core and modules. Again, that's a constant, it's something we already work with. We need to keep that in the back of our mind. Again, it depends on whether it lands on our BAU, our business as usual side, or whether it lands into our build project. Does one influence the other? Do these other things need to happen in terms of security? Again, module compatibility, stability, security, same sort of thing again. Uh, and we need to consider that for the current state, and of course the future's that. Um, security advisories, those recurring updates, are just general maintenance. A big one, which then we'll talk to, theming compatibility. This is a big one for 9 to 10. All right. Um, <laughs> again, uh, we've got an end of life for Drupal 9. Thankfully, not anytime soon, but it's on the horizon. Uh, again, customer time frames, their activities, their skill sets. Um, when I think about our immediate time, we're going to have to go to probably Drupal 9.5 before we think about 10. Again, part of that's compatibility, part of that's stability with these things, part of that's where is the community. And of course, um, my new favourite one, moving CK Editor. Um, and there's questions about whether or not there's an impact for our customers, so we're thinking the content editing component here. Um, and of course, if there's an impact for our work on that as well. And then, the balancing act. It's all of these things, it's the things we've already talked about. How do we, how do we prioritise, how do we organize all those lovely things that's for reform to manage <laughs> so when we think about some of this hands-on and we've talked obviously to what we did last time with that hands-on for the agency well it probably has to change a bit this time around i don't want to be the bearer of bad news but this is probably going to be the reality. um we can automate upgrades like this is a test um we can't have complete coverage that's I think that's unrealistic for anyone trying to do anything, regardless of whether it's us, or whether it's Drupal, or whether it's anything. Um, some of these issues are just going to manifest themselves as we pop them up. So again, that's contingencies, but unforeseen, unexpected issues. Again, 
I'm not trying to name names, I'm not trying to blame anyone, but potentially sometimes it's the approach that was taken to building something at the time and writing a new feature, whether that's the site owner, whether that's the development partner. Hey, it might have even been a decision that we made in how people are using our product. So we could all potentially be guilty of that one. Um, the old classic things just don't work. What could that be? Um, and of course, the big one for us is we can do all of these things at a code level. For us, for our side, hey, that module's enabled, this thing is on, it's running. Is it actually working? Well, we can say yes to a lot of those things, but I don't own that content, I don't know what people are looking at. Can I have coverage across 350 near websites? No. The best people in those sort of scenarios are going to be those side owners, those that are responsible for it. <sighs> Sorry. In all, in all aspects of any of this, we've all got a part to play. Go team. Um, this time, we're probably going to need more. So, and this is something we'll be communicating to our community. Um, this is a bullet point that we had really early on. Um, site owners retain ownership and management of their content, information architecture, and can theme their sites. Um, I'm hoping that pink comes up all right, or I can theme their sites there. Apologies if it's not. Um, is it aligns to their business needs, branding strategy, stakeholder preferences. So, a lot of our automation last time for theming was pretty straightforward, quote unquote, um, about what the issues were. Most of them manifested themselves as is it compatible with your blog? Can it, does it, does it have the right classes? All of these sorts of things. There's a lot of that again for Drupal 10, but there's a lot of deprecation as well. Oh my goodness. Um, and apologies, um, having sat in the back of the room earlier, this will be very hard to say and I'll describe. Once again, we have smart people. <coughs> um, those smart people working on our platform, um, specifically the Salesforce at the moment, we've actually now got a job in our pipeline, which is running. It's not part of the current build processes, process. So if you are a customer and you've got access to that project space, you might see fail. <laughs> Thankfully, it's only a fail against D10 compatibility. The first screenshot up the top here um, is our D10 compatibility task. Um, the tabs we have across the top on the right says tests, and that's marked with 18. Jumping into this, we can actually see what those errors are from a deprecation standpoint on a project right now. For any project that's on our platform that does at least is Drupal 9. Drupal 7, we're saying bye bye, so we're not obviously focusing our time there. Um, but when we think about this, we're actually now already serving information to our customers about what their challenges are. They're probably going to have to go back into the, their laps with their site developer, with their development partners, or themselves, depending on what those relationships are. Um, some of the doozies we've got here, I'm sure what you're all probably familiar with Mario if you come from a theming perspective, um, there's quite a few changes here. Again, We've got information here that says what is the problem, when it was deprecated, where it was, and how you can fix it. How are we for time? Oh, all right. Okay. That's a more detailed one of those. I won't hold on to that. Um, let's hit some really quick points here to get ourselves over the line. Build, build challenges, triple line compatibility. This chart on the right hand side talks about our growth of modules that are already DK10 compatible. 42% in our distro already have a path, 30% of modules have already been upgraded D10. We just keep growing and growing. Um, we're aligned to what's available, that ties into what's still available, what's needed. Ah, there's our formatting one. These are the modules that we're looking at that don't fit that model at the moment. A group of security. And I've written this functionality. So these are the ones that are currently going to prevent us from moving to 10 or are still in tranche in that sort of space. These are the ones that we want to help contribute back. And if you've got anything to contribute there as well, even better too. We would love to hear from you. Home stretch. So we're going to use the same approach. It worked last time, it will work again. We will build the D10 foundations, and we will do the security assessment, and we will launch our websites. Um, we will take all the things that worked well and make them better, and we'll take all the things that didn't work so well and make them better. 
Uh, we've iterated into a more cyclic um, foundations. Our DevOps preparation and insights will inform our distro, and our distro informs our insights, and so it will go until we launch our distribution. Uh, well, just before, we will do the security assessment, launch the distro, and then proceed upgrading our websites. The time frame looks something like this. Twice the effort and half the time. Uh, at best now, from this point, we have about seven months left to finish developing the distro and uh, to launch it. We've given a month ourselves a month to do the security assessment, the last time we did three. And we've given ourselves three months to do the automation by last time we had uh, a little bit of a buffer in the end, which I know we'll need, but we've got to get the majority at the beginning of uh, in our launch time frame, leaving the buffer for the stragglers. And then we will retire this later. That's after our coffee break. The time frame will look like this. Remember, remember eight and how nice and spaced and we had a break and it was great. Uh, this is twice the effort in half the amount of time. We will be kicking off weekly. We will still give the agencies two weeks to do their UAT, uh, and they will still be able to pick which time frame they want, but we won't have the luxury of a before and after financial year. Uh, and we are very much constrained by the end of life with people. Right, Yep, just look at the next slide for me. So again, I talked to Paz earlier, it's very much a site ownership perspective. Those who own it and run on it already should already be familiar with it. If they're not, PHP is running out of time, 7.4, update it or I'll come and scream at you uh, in the nicest possible way. Um, again, those site updates, it's on them. We're trying to keep them a bit more informed about it, uh, help them help themselves. We want them to connect with their security teams so they're doing the right thing if they're not on top of stuff or they need potential resources or help. Um, and of course, they need to keep in touch with us if, I, if I'm not already my need them. Um, this slide is questions. We won't ask questions we're out of time. I hope it was informative for you. Hopefully there's still some morning tea floating around. Um, please come and chat to us. We have a booth. We're around, look for the tall guy melting. Um, for the shorter one with the GovCMS shirt, and there's a couple more of us around. Thank you for your time, everyone.